personalized medicine. Um, and one of the barriers that I've been seeing is how do we incorporate personalized treatment into a system that is particularly focused on standardized care. So how can we make personalized medicine standard? <laughs> By writing a lot of letters to the government and trying to make a case, uh, given examples of where uh, the concept of personalized medicine uh, can make a difference to the management of, of a child or individual across the lifespan or at the moment. Um, right now, that's where we are left largely outside of research for funding. Things like whole exome sequencing, we're not yet at the clinical service level for whole genome sequencing. Um, and we write letters multiple times as clinicians working with these individuals and families to make a case why this is also more cost effective and will impact the, the child who we are working with. Um, and I. You know, other, there's many other arguments, but often um, not as compelling, at least to government, as how we can change management and outcome as well of that individual. And I think that heightens awareness since our health system is provincially and federally funded. It's sort of a one-stop um, shop for that. And it's an advantage in some cases, but also a disadvantage. And I think it's up to us to educate also government as well as individuals and families. Yeah. I mean, Tad, I think it's a great question and a huge challenge, obviously. Um, you might be, I fully agree with Dr. Lewis, and I'm also thinking at the same time, some of the treatments which we propose are hugely expensive. Think of enzyme replacement therapy, um, you know, the, the gene editing, which is coming our way, super exciting, but are we willing or able to pay as a society? I think um, that is a problem, period, but and advocating for and showing that um, that a lifetime cost of a child with autism, for example, is $3 million, and even though there might only at this point be a subset whom you could treat in a personalized way, I think you can show, and we've done that with our study as well, and are hoping to publish that soon, is that a lifetime of cost savings. So, you know, if you look at, you know, what you can prevent, also adverse effects with pharmacogenomics, I think, you know, it might actually end up quite well, but we'll still have to work with pharmacy, the big pharmaceutical companies who have to have their earnings, and sometimes in a ridiculous way, in my opinion, but that'll come down with government, uh, hospitals, patients, and families. It, we just have to, to make it work. I'll try and answer on that. Um, you know, it, it would fall into a, a family. I mean, we're, we're tend to be um, groupers rather than splitters when it comes to, you know, in, in clinical medicine. And um, sometimes I think it's important to split as well, though. And in this particular case, would say it would fall into a family of autoimmune conditions, of course, causing quite significant um, uh, physical disabilities. And what we're learning from other you know, autoimmune-related conditions, not necessarily rheumatoid arthritis, you know, we'd have to actually go to that community of clinicians and find out what they're working with and, and developing on a personalized medicine scale. It's not something I'm aware of. But what we're learning from other uh, uh, autoimmune conditions is that they follow the same kind of complex genetic kind of inheritance, a combination of where genetic factors interact with environmental factors those that might be within our own bodies that can impact uh, how genes express, like our own autoimmune factors, uh, sometimes where our bodies turn in against ourselves, or may interact with components of the environment around us. And it takes a multi-pronged approach and really, I think, careful looking at every individual to find out, well, what are the commonalities we're seeing in rheumatoid arthritis and what are the differences? But to my knowledge, there hasn't been much progress in the rheumatoid arthritis field, but I would stand corrected if anyone working in the field uh, would want to clarify that. Yeah. 
And I think maybe taking it again to the rare, uh, some, some cases with um, very early onset of, of these type of arthritis, which uh, is clearly not falling in the common group sometimes by, by studying them genomically to pinpoint that single gene which may be at play in that patient can inform about you know which cascades are there of inflammation which really set it off that the body turns against him or herself and to try to intervene in a little bit more targeted way than for example with steroids where it's just taking a big hammer and sort of silencing the immune system so I, I'm sure you've already learned and then read about that but in that sense I, I think there there is progress being made, although sometimes that progress is only applicable to a, a small subset of uh, patients. But I'd still be very hopeful uh, that, that there will be some, some progress, which hopefully will benefit you as well. I would also put intellectual disability into that category as well. You know, that's largely, uh, you know, like I say, symptomatic labels apply to all of those different things. It, just like hearing loss is <laughs> as well. Uh, you know, many of those, o obesity as well is again an, a symptom. And I think it, it takes um, a combination of approaches, those that are the higher technology omic approaches, but also re realizing the value of clinical medicine as well and, and looking at you know, breaking down the, the lumping that's been done under these symptomatic labels and look at it more at a person level. And, and that was sort of the concept, you know, where we're, that we're moving forward towards an autism. And often sometimes we're left with a dilemma at the end of a sequencing uh, effort in an individual where we don't have very good information about what it relates to in terms of phenotype, you know, those symptomatic labels like epilepsy, autism, intellectual disability. And that's where we also can't forget those, those clinicians working with the individual, also the input of those individuals themselves and their family members to broaden the scope of, of phenotypic features so that we get better information that informs those higher technologies, genetic, microbiome, metabolomic medicine. And it's tough work, uh, and it's not necessarily being done uniformly, but I think that's where these kinds of programs that are evolving through clinical centers like BC Children's, through Sunny Hill Health Center and others, and working collaboratively with other centers will build that resource ultimately. And I think you will find different ways of defining these diagnoses ongoing that will be more meaningful from a personalized medicine, but we're not quite there yet from a personalized medicine approach, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I, I think of the, the symptoms like intellectual disability, maybe even epilepsy as a little bit comparable to fever even, right? Yeah. I mean, if you like, show up with fever at your GP or you wake up with it, I mean, you will think, uh, is, it in, you know, is it an infection? Where is the infection? Is it 
and arthritis, you know, uh, throbbing. So I, I also, I think it's important to reiterate again that sometimes it's environmental only, just to give an example, meningitis, bad infection, you know, can leave scars on the brain, will, will give rise to epilepsy, although in some it does, and in others it doesn't. Could that be the microbiome playing a role? Is there a genetic susceptibility? And so, it, yeah, in my opinion, um, one answer leads to the next question, but the short of it is probably that, yes, these are, are more symptoms than, let's say, diagnosis on its own. Yeah, I would just add that they're, they're quite clinically valid, of course. I mean, they, they help us in terms of understanding what to treat and, and provide services, et cetera, for those things. So they're, they're important. I don't mean to diminish that either. Um, I, I think you know, we need, though, to think of what the definition is of personalized medicine or genomic medicine. And it truly is treating the cause, not the symptom, and using that biology to define what the treatment might best be, but also in concert with understanding the physiology and working with the basic scientists in the lab who then functionalize all this information. Also the bioinformaticians where we throw it all into one big pot and leave it to them to figure it all out through big data systems. Uh, but it's getting that data to begin with that is really essential. NIPT is currently available, as I said, through commercial entities, and the price is in the order of $500. And the time for result is about seven to 10 days. So it's, it's, it can really be applied clinically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I Not that it's just research. I think our, our frustration is even in the application of what we've already found. Um, I think that there's been a huge amount of, of investment in the research. I think there's been a huge amount of progress made over the last few years. And I think the difficulty is actually to actually translate that into clinical care rapidly and um, to and that's, that is funding, and I think it's also not only funding, but it's essentially the funders to give more responsibilities to the clinicians <coughs> and say, you know, like, this is ready, and, and we shouldn't have to beg every time we want to do this test. And uh, so I think it's a real kind of shift in philosophy. I, I would strongly echo that as well. Um, I also think um, you know there's a lot of emphasis going on in direct-to-consumer testing as well too, and um, I think you know we've become so accustomed to our socialized healthcare system, and it's great. I'm not demeaning that in any way, but at the same time, putting it in the hands of of the technology and what's available in the hands of individuals, uh, uh, their family members even, who want to see the best potential, uh, uh, or the highest potential achieved for their, their child or, or son or daughter or family member. Also um, develop a more, again, focused uh, treatment that's based on cause rather than symptoms. If the technology is already there, we already know the power of, of it, but sometimes you know, it just takes so long to get that one individual tested, and then you, know, you still try and make a case that you, once you've done that one individual, make an example of why it's of value to other, keeping 
keeping it within that socialized health network. I think if by involving individuals, patients, families together in the research and allowing them also the opportunity to participate and, and contribute to the research enterprise or even a direct-to-consumer care that's available through various commercial entities, it's not within our reach within the hospital, uh, we have to ask government to pay for it, um, but that would also advance things a lot quicker as well, I think. Um, and, you know, it's not meant, to, again, to change socialized medicine, but to put part of the care and direction of, of health within the hands of those who most need it. If I could just make one um, other comment from a research point of view. Um, I think that things are moving more rapidly because um, families are getting involved and social media is playing a huge role. Um, you know, Clara sort of alluded to a case like that, but I had a similar case where an exome showed us a gene that, you know, I did a PubMed search and there was very little known about that gene. And then I did a Google search and I found someone's blog. And the father had been told that this was a likely candidate and posted it. And within, you know, weeks, there was a number of cases and they all had the same phenotype and, it, you know, it was the gene. So I think families and social media is, is really helping us identify these genes that are candidates as true pathogenic genes. Um, and they probably will play a role, I mean, they all be playing a role in recruitment of patients to studies. And so things may be done in a much more cost-effective way um, than it was before. Mm -hmm. And if one more thing, uh, probably the, the access to therapies is a huge thing. I have sometimes the feeling that we're, we're working, I mean, the diagnostic omics is sort of plowing ahead and we've shown you examples, lots is possible. But then I'm often faced with a child who then has a diagnosis, but then to place that child or family in connection with the physician or the investigator leading a trial or treating these patients in a very specialized way is a huge endeavor, um, which rightfully so needs a lot of ethics approval and this and that, but I think we're now in an age where we can hardly sell this anymore to our patients, that we know there's a treatment out there which could potentially work, we know what the child has, and yet here we are saying, you know, yeah, I'm sorry, but even with telehealth or whatever, we, we can't make this happen. You have to travel to Spain now. Yes. <laughs> and this does feed back, this is clinical practice, but it feeds back into research because if we want to figure out whether these treatments are actually working for patients and how they work and for which patients they do or don't, we have to treat patients and not mice and not sort of end of the line patients who are so sick that nothing else will work anyway, so let's treat them. We also need to treat them in an earlier yeah. stage. So, I mean, I'm not saying this to you so you can solve the problem, but I do think, think about it often that I think connectivity is going to be a huge uh, next leap which we have to, to make with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe the perspective from the founder, I would say, to that question. Um, genomics now, as we discussed, the technology is there, the tools are there, the cost is decreased. Now, you ha we have to be able to share the data. And we still, many of us, working in little silos, little groups, little uh, you know, province, we don't even share between the province and the data. So we have international colleagues now that are helping us get to that in rare diseases genomics and personalized medicine actually do for people whose diagnoses come maybe later in life or past that intervention window? What can it actually do for them? 
I, I don't believe anybody's passed an intervention window, to be quite honest. I, I think, and we don't know that, you know, but, um, uh, if, well, I guess we, we focus at children, of course, obviously in children, but one of the, the great benefits of being a clinical or medical geneticist is that we also follow that individual across the lifespan. And I, I think that that's really important. And um, there is, I don't think any condition that is beyond a, an intervention, you know, autism, for example, my area of study, um, you know, treatments can go beyond those that are pharmacogenomic or targeted sometimes at the physiology. Sometimes we have to make it simpler too at times. And that if you have a, a diagnosis where you have, you know, really characterize what the major deficits are and the major strengths at a more functional level rather than maybe medical level. You can still work to optimize those, those skills, those talents, the strengths in that individual and maybe try to minimize them through the behavioral interventions that are already in the place. Providing you know, now really quite limited services but expand upon them in terms of speech and language therapy. I've happened to have, see and witness a 55 year old man with autism who also had a degree of cognitive delay as well, who never spoke a word in his life. And yet, given the right tools from a very you know, able speech and language therapist and using uh, keyboards and certain programs, it, it, the brain is very plastic. Even at age 50, 55, he started to speak and, and talk in sentences. And I'll forever carry that that example that forward that no one is beyond intervention if it's you know at any point in time maybe we do think they aren't because we don't try as hard but I think we, we do need to make that effort. Um, stepping back to the microbiome, I'm curious if there has been research done on um, connecting the microbiome to very common mental disorders like depression and anxiety and if so what do you know about um, not to my knowledge, autism is one of the ones at the forefront of this field, looking at it from more neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric perspective. Um, but uh, you know, that, that, at least not in Canada that I'm aware of. There may be groups in the states that are looking at it. Um, uh, you know, we're starting to recognize the connectivity uh, symptomatically and etiologically, meaning from a causative perspective, uh, across many different neuropsychiatric conditions and neurodevelopmental conditions. It's like a big tree, right, where there's limbs that are all sort of interrelated, and then the main trunk is like the neurodevelopmental label, right, of a, of a condition. Um, and, you know, the, it can be intellectual disability is one arm, autism, there might be, you know, co-occurring um, other psychiatric conditions like anxiety, bipolar, depression, they're all part of it. But so by putting a concentrated effort in different fields like autism, epilepsy, intellectual disability, we learn more about some of the other comorbidities that are common among some of those conditions. But we don't, so again, I think where there's splitting and lumping that can serve to benefit the understanding going forward when we do the same things for the same groups of individuals. Uh, but there wouldn't be reason to believe that they don't play an impact as an environmental factor. It's not the sole explanation, but um, uh, a combination of things. And I think that one's very important. I don't know if that answered your question. It's a little bit skirting around things, but it's short and simple. Not that I'm aware of for depression or anxiety. Choice to want to be screened or not screened. Um, the easier the test, 
the more it's perceived as a great test, then perhaps there's a, a, a concept that you know everybody would want that test when in fact that's not the case. I don't think everybody wants to know clearly if they have a fetus affected with a genetic condition. So I think if the barrier is currently cost, the challenge will be making sure that even when it becomes the test available to pregnant women, that they still have they still make an informed choice and that it doesn't become just like, you know, I'm gonna do your blood tests to know if you're O negative, you know, we want not want the NFT to just be that same kind of routine checklist. So that'll be the challenge. Uh, maybe a follow-up question on the yeah. ethics of um, mm -hmm. NIPT. Um, what will happen if I'm pregnant and I want to test my baby, my fetus, yeah. and the fetal DNA gives a normal genome, but my genome mm -hmm. comes <laughs> abnormal? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 yeah. I think it really makes a very interesting point. Um, that um, I mean, at the moment, we're not really um, sequencing the details of the DNA. So we're, we're there is going to be many years to come before we truly do a fetal genome and we sequence everything. But even with the current technology, there are some false positives. So there are women who have an IPT that are a false positive. Um, meaning the baby's not affected, but then in fact we find that they have, they have a low grade Turner syndrome, which is a chromosomal abnormality, uh, which they didn't know about. Um, and the, uh, one of probably the most exciting thing that's come out of this research as well, um, and reported in the states from centers who've done large numbers, is that we know that cancer genome, so cancer cells have a lot of chromosomal abnormality. And in fact, women who went for screening for Down syndrome have been found to have a positive result, like a positive and IPT result for multiple chromosomes. So not just 21, but 21, 18, it was weird. The baby was not affected, and they were found to have cancer. So in fact, this field of NIPT, which was done for prenatal, is really pushing the field of, of non-invasive screening for cancer, recognizing that this may be a way that we can detect ovarian cancer, for example, who frequently have chromosomal abnormality and are very hard to detect you know, or to screen for at the moment. So what we're learning in one level area is actually opening completely new areas of, of research and application. The power of genomics. The power of genomics, <laughs> yeah. Yes, the companies who went into it for the pregnant women realize now that they have a way bigger market <laughs> when they're gonna invest in screening for cancer. There's, uh, the, the, where the challenge is, is for the most, the majority of autism cases, you know, the 80%, let's say, that don't have a single rare identified gene, like Fragile X was the example I gave, or a copy number variant that you can look at through a test called chromosomal microarray. Um, because it's one of these complex genetic conditions, it's the combination of factors. And in, and in reality, you know, your genomics will, a whole genome sequencing would probably be the best approach for that, rather than what is now available more commonly called whole exome sequencing. That's looking at the important protein coding areas of the genome that are producing you know, proteins that might disrupt neurological functions much more significantly, um, maybe linked more with those complex cases where you're having other you know, co-occurring conditions like epilepsy or intellectual disability. The whole genome sequencing alone, in the absence of any correlation to the clinical phenotype, or perhaps even in the absence of any correlation to 
family history, prenatal history, uh, the child's medical history, is really difficult. So that's where this clustering concept comes in. I mean, it's still largely in the research field that we're going to be looking at clusters of clinical syndromes, conditions, I should say, symptoms, clusters of clinical symptoms, and identify those that are more commonly shared amongst a group of individuals with autism. What's similar, what's different, and so there might be some shared between them, but within those clusters themselves, they might be different. And you start whole genome sequencing of that, and you can identify these genetic fingerprints and say that's the foundational level, the, the, the very clear clinical genome testing, the phenotype, the genome, but we need to layer on all these other features, like the microbiome, the metabolome. We'll get that more detailed fingerprint, but any one of those features alone or any one of those levels alone is still at a very challenging level to pay for it at a whole genome level. The whole exome, I wouldn't say it's, um, you know, within autism itself, there's about a 20% chance of finding an identifiable cause at that whole exome level. The rarer causes uh, um, individually, but more, you know, 20% amongst autism in general. But that 1% can make a big difference to the outcome of a child if it perhaps it also is treatable with, like, uh, can overlap quite commonly in cases that Claire and I share as well. So sometimes it's worth that chance. Are there companies that do that if it's not Yes, there are. Yeah. And for in the clinic setting where we get a refusal from MSP to, to do that testing, and we go, we don't just try it once, believe me, we're stubborn <laughs> folks. We go back many times and often threaten medical legal action, but sometimes that doesn't fly very well. Um, but um, then the families do sometimes ask, well, what can I do to pay for this? And we have no investment in any of these companies, but we're happy to help in seeking information um, that we then share with the family to help them decide what might be the best approach and the kinds of things we look for and getting the best result for your money. You know, the challenge of a 23andMe approach is that you get a lot of information that is just out there from very sometimes scattered sources and done in very variable populations. And what it means to you individually is kind of lacking, in my opinion, and lacks the, the relevance of interpretation of working with a clinical geneticist or a biochemical geneticist to help guide what those t test results mean. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> So within, you're talking about within autoimmune, autoimmune conditions, um, like have you done for that, or just in general? I mean, when you, when you get any sequencing test result, you always have the risk of finding incidental findings that aren't the initial reason that you sought you know, the testing for in the first place. And in that process, we often get information like that. It's like, oh, okay, well, this might be something actionable. And we try our very best to look at literature sources and the information that's available out there, talk to our colleagues, and decide that this information, if it's important to the health of the individual, yes, it's up to us to share that. But it's going to take that same kind of interdisciplinary, collaborative, global approach for the autoimmune conditions in general to make a difference. I mean, one very recent one um, is, is in the area of asthma. There was a lot of work going on at UBC, the work of Dr. Brett Finley and Dr. Bill Moan and Dr. Stuart Turvey at Children's Hospital, who looked specifically at the microbiome and found that, yes, this was a, a, an area of interest for asthma, uh, not necessarily autoimmune per se, but another complex genetic disorder um, that in a symptomatic label also, that showed a culprit, you know, organisms that were s consistently and significantly different in individuals with asthma than they were in non-asthmatics. And that could be even treated by 
probiotics or you know, some kind of change in your, your, your body makeup of these microorganisms that made a difference to them. And I remember Dr. Finley on TV saying, you know, it's healthy for your child to eat dirt. <laughs> you know, let, let them do that. And that's how, you know, I think we've become so sterile around us as well, too, that we're changing. That's probably one of the main changing environmental factors that, you know, when we're having more C-sections and babies aren't being colonized normally through the vaginal delivery process, through the that bugs in the, the vagina. Um, that that could be changing things. It's still speculative, but we don't know unless we look. I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll have to stop here. But thank you very, very much. It was a very good discussion tonight. Thank you.